If you go to a city like Caracas or you go to a city like Sao Paulo or Santiago or Moscow or Paris, you know, you can quickly understand which cities are more unequal than others, not because you read an article on The Economist about that or because you had access to statistics on, on the Gini coefficient of each one of these countries, but because, you know, these cities look contrasting and some cities look more contrasting than others. So, for example, a city like Caracas looks extremely contrasting, you know, compared, you know, to a city like Paris, you know, or a city like Santiago also has, you know, a certain degree of, of contrast. The thing is understanding this contrast and, and, and measuring, you know, the, the, the spatial structure that is defined by urban inequality has been uh, historically quite difficult. So what we have been trying to do in, in my group is to try to leverage the fact that now there are large collections of online imagery available online and we have created tools that allow us to take those images and transform them into evaluated maps of cities with respect to different questions. So the way that this works is kind of simple. We take online images you know, of different places that are picked at random. So let's say that we take a bunch of images from New York City and a bunch of images from Moscow and a bunch of images from Paris. And we put them side by side in a site and we ask a question, which place looks safer? Which place looks more unique? Which place looks more upper class? Which place looks more historical? Which place looks more modern? Which place looks more lively? Which place looks more depressing? So people click on one image or the other image and that eventually helps us inform, little by little, as we accumulate clicks, which are the places that are associated more or less with each one of these evaluative criteria with respect to other places. So we did a pilot study in which we collected hundreds of thousands of votes for four images, for Boston, New York, Linz, and Salzburg. And what we found is that although the averages of all of these cities were more or less the same with respect to safety, uniqueness, and how upper class they, they look, you know, the standard deviation of Boston and New York were significantly higher. So the best of New York and the worst of New York were much further apart than the best and worst of Salzburg. And the you know, best of Boston and the worst of Boston were also you know, further apart. What this showed is that actually like, the experience of living in a city like Boston or New York is a more unequal experience for a person than the experience of living in a city like Linz and Salzburg. So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to leverage, you know, these type of methods to extend into a research agenda that would allow us to explore a number of questions with respect to urban perception. So one of the questions is, well, how do these things actually relate to other type of social and economic indicators such as crime, you know, or, you know, such as income or, or, or you know, such as, you know, uh, gun violence and, and, and these other type of things. In the case of you know, safety and in the case of New York, we found that actually after controlling for income and after controlling for population, there is a significant association between the way that a place looks and you know, uh, how much violent crime you have on that zip code. Certainly, we cannot assume that this is causal evidence of you know, perception causing crime, but you know, it indicates that there is information about the location of crimes that is not contained only on the population, income, gender, or area of a uh, zip code. Other things that we want to explore, you know, is, you know, different questions about, for example, uh, different neighborhoods that were built under, you know, different architectural styles, different forms of social housing. How are they perceived nowadays? You know, are they perceived, you know, in ways that, you know, are safe or unsafe? Are they perceived in ways that maybe, you know, uh, affect, you know, the, the well-being of the people that live on them? Now, we believe that those questions are important because ultimately the way that a place looks has always been considered somehow of a frivolous type of, of, of thing. And in reality, I tend to completely disagree with that view. I think that beauty is not something that is optional or is something that is frivolous. I think that we are able to perceive beauty because ultimately when we look at something and we find beauty on, on that object or on that landscape, it's because we have been able to detect some sort of highly complex form of order that maybe is not very obvious to us. And that beauty, that feeling of beauty, that feeling of the place being harmonious or safe or, 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 or lively, you know, is telling us something you know, that might be hard to quantify, but that might be important, might be fundamental. And since we have not been able to quantify it, we have not been able to incorporate it into our design criteria. So you think about the way that social housing has been constructed, you know, it has been in a way in which people look at the number of square meters, they look whether there's going to be heat, they look that there's going to be you know, water, and all those type of things. But the way that it actually looks, and whether the people that is going to live there are going to feel empowered, are going to feel that they're living you know, in, in, in a society that, that is including them, you know, is not very much being considered. 
So if we were able now to incorporate those things, would we be able to have you know, better designs of ways in which we would develop housing and you know, that would include these other aesthetic components that we have left out? I hope so. I hope that by, by, by creating measures of urban perception that are quantitatively precise, you know, that are reproducible, that allow us to compare cities, we're able to do that. Other things that we can do with that is that in reality, you know, a lot of people talk about rich and poor countries. You know, I actually don't even like the rich and poor countries question. You know, and one of the reasons that why I don't like that question is because in reality, you know, there are no countries that are rich and countries that are poor. There are countries that have a larger percentage of the population that is richer than others. But even in the poorest country, there's people that is way richer than poor people in the rich countries. Okay? So in some sense, it's always like a mixed strategy. Now, if you have detailed maps over perception, you're going to be able to say things as well. Maybe there are some neighborhoods you know, in New York that are on par with the worst half of the neighborhoods in Johannesburg. And that, I think, is a very interesting you know, message that would be coming to people that are thinking about you know, the way that their city compares to others, because those comparisons you know, have not been possible. So there is more or less, I think, a little bit of an idea that, that people that live you know, in the more developed countries that are all better off than the ones that live in the developing countries. And in reality, when you travel around, you find that that is not necessarily the case. And in order to have these comparisons, you know, looking at the ways that places, uh, looking at comparing the, the way in which places look, might help us you know, start you know, parsing out those cities, try to decompose the cities of some countries as a function of cities of other countries, and ultimately determine you know, uh, new paradigms and guidelines for urban perception. There's a lot of technical difficulties implied in this research. You know, first, certainly the use of online images from, from one of these mapping repositories that is available is useful because the images are all quite normalized. So they were taken more or less with the same equipment. You know, they were taken at similar times of the day, usually in the morning. And also what I like about those images you know, is that those images, you know, uh, cover like an extensive area of a city. Usually when people tend to think about New York, you know, they think about Times Square, or they think about, you know, like where Wall Street is, or Central Park, which are sort of like the nice parts. But in reality, in order to compare two cities fairly, we have to assume that you would be thrown in a random place of a city. And in this case, those images allow us to see the random places, you know, allow us to see the places that look good, but also the places that look bad. And that coverage is good and positive. Certainly, you know, the perspective of the images is basically from the center of the street, which is maybe not the best perspective that you want to get. And, you know, there are some things that are occluded from that view. In some cities, for instance, there's a lot of things that happen behind, you know, like hedges or behind, you know, the, the trees that would not be visible, you know, from the perspective of, of the center of the street. Technically, there's a lot of limitations that involve the statistics. So if we want to compare a city like New York, like a city uh, with a city like Paris, how many images are enough images to have a good sample for New York? and a good sample for Paris, such that we can make that comparison. And we can say, actually, Paris looks safer than New York, or New York looks safer than Paris. Do we need 2,000 images per city? Do we need 4,000 images per city? You know, how many images per square kilometer we need? So that's one limitation. The other limitation is, well, how many clicks we're going to need, and how many clicks we're expected to get? You know, if I have 5,000 images and 5,000 images, and I want to compare each image with each other once, I need 2.5 million clicks. And that's a lot of online traffic. Is it possible to create methods that allow us to rank you know, the images with respect to each other with very sparse data? Do we always need humans to make those clicks? Or after we get enough clicks, can we train machine learning algorithms to identify the features that are associated with safety or with uniqueness, with upper class, with a historical neighborhood, and actually then feed images and have the computer you know, classify them automatically for us? You know, maybe that is something that it's possible and that's how we can extend the resolution and the coverage of these evaluated maps. So those are some of the technical challenges that, that we're looking into. You know, other technical challenges include the identification of features. Can we use you know, these rankings that we have obtained and the images that we were used to generate those rankings to identify what are the features that are associated with a place looking safer, with a place looking more unique, with a place looking more modern? Are there, you know, let's say, fences on the windows, the things that make a place look unsafe? You know, or is it you know, cracked pavement? Is it you know, damaged cars? You know, those are things that eventually we can also think that we can try to leverage you know, the data that we have been collecting 
and machine learning algorithms that are in existence to be able to see if we can identify those features. So technically, there's, there's, there's a set of challenges that, that, we can, you know, that, that we can look into. There are also some important you know, policy questions that we can think of. You know, so within a certain municipality, are the resources employed in beautification used you know, to address the, the problems of the streets or the neighborhoods that need it the most? Or do we have a system that actually fits forward? Maybe you know, we have societies in which you know, the places that are more popular get constantly fixed and refixed and refixed, and you, know, you go 10 blocks away from that, and there are streets that, that are in, in vast need of improvement, but you know, they, they never get their chance. You know? So if we would have a map of how places actually look and are perceived, and where spending is, is happening, we would be able to compare the two and see, well, actually, is spending uh, being allocated in a way that is reducing these inequalities or that is enhancing these inequalities. You know, at the moment, you know, it's hard to tell because we're lacking these maps. <laughs>